silence court right. effect on competition. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that what the divisional court was talking about? They were talking about actual effect on the decision under challenge. Well, we say they go hand in glove. Right. Because, of course, the, the, the competition was between two schemes. Yes, yes. And if, if there's a distortion that I contend tied into the guarantee, then, the, then it's both. But it has to be distortion of the, of the market. However defined that is. Well, well, in this case, it is a distortion of the structure of competition. The structure yeah. of the market. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. We start with the OTT case, which is Authorities 1, Tab 10. <coughs> Expressing the proposition that you seek to gain from each of these decisions, yes. and then you, you can take maybe you can take the references reasonably swiftly. Pretty rapid. Does that suit you? Well, yes. Mm. Yeah. So the proposition here is well, the, the first proposition. There is a distinct line of case law yep. uh, based on, on a conflict of interest. That's point one. Yes. And the second point. Once that structural feature is caused by a stage measure, the mere possibility that the conflict of interest might be relied upon by the beneficiary is sufficient, and one does not need, therefore, to uh, have an actual uh, taking advantage of, of, of the conflict of interest. Yeah. So, very rapidly in the facts, you'll see the bottom of, the, of that page, uh, OTT had a, had a monopoly in one market, public telephony, and they, they were given a second uh, privilege by being required to authorise uh, competitors' equipment. And then if you lordships can uh, go forward to paragraph 23, which is on 5981, the judgment. And it starts according to RTT. Yes. I think it's uh, 20, oh, we, can, we can count it back. Yes, it's the second paragraph on page 5981. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, 
perhaps a, it's an incumbent's argument or cheat as well, uh, there could there could be a finding of infringement. Of course, now Article 106. Only if the member state had favoured and abused the court. OTT itself had in fact committed infringement, for example, by applying the provisions of type approval in a discriminatory manner. It emphasizes that the order of correctness does not state that any abuse has actually taken place, and that the mere possibility of discriminatory application <coughs> cannot itself amount to an abuse. And then the next paragraph, you see the court uh, gives that a short trip. That, that argument cannot be accepted. And you see the reason in the following paragraph, a system of undistorted competition can only be guaranteed, uh, only if the equality of opportunity is secured as between the various economic operators. Then at the bottom of the page, it talks about the, the obvious advantage being granted to, to the beneficiary of, of, of the measure. And just so there's no doubt of this, if we can just flick back to the Advocate General's opinion in, in tab 10A. This time it's at paragraph 43. So we start at 42, the last sentence. You want your tab out? The previous tab 10A, mm. the AG's opinion in the same case. Yes. Yeah. So he, he says, uh, last sentence of the paragraph 42, the state's delegation of power approval, only the misuse of which could lead to abuse, does not seem to be to constitute such an abuse. And then 43, um, last sentence, says that without embracing the mere possibility of such conduct or such action. So that, that was essentially the same argument made by OTT at paragraph 23, and we saw paragraphs 24 and 25, and rejected it in that in terms. So the, the mere possibility created by a structure in which the state measure causes a conflict of interest is sufficient for the violation of Article 161 to crystallize. Uh, second case, ambulance lock, but this time authorities two. Have 15. Again, we have A and B with the court judgment and the, 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 the AG's opinion. Now, the, 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 the innovation in this case, so in the OTP case we've just seen, the, uh, the state measure granted the power to the incumbent to approve, as a regulatory matter, the competitors' equipment, equipment. And that gave rise to a conflict of interest because they were competing with the very persons whose equipment they were approving. And the, the innovation of Ambulance Lochner, the court has uh, expanded the principle to include a situation where, like the present, a competitor is given merely a right of consultation in respect of the fate of the competing operator. And we can pick this up in paragraph 12 of the judgment. Well, your, your shorthand name for this case is? Uh, ambulance Lock. Thank you. So we, we can pick this up in paragraph 12. Yeah. So Ambulance Lock can apply for renewal of their authorization to provide ambulance services, and then two medical organizations entrusted with the public ambulance service, so a different market, namely ASB and DLK, were invited to express their views on the effects which the request for authorization will have. You see, you see at 13, uh, they both uh, objected to, to Ambulance Lochner's application. And one thing I would note, the last sentence of 13, um, so the reasons the objections were that they were running at 26% um, under capacity, and in fact their services were lost. So, so on the face of it, these were jolly good reasons of why they might well have, have objected to, to, to a new license being, being granted. And then if we can turn to paragraph 43. enacting, in this case, a state measure, the application of which involves prior consultation of the medical aid organizations in respect of any application for authorization to provide non-emergency patient transport services by the independent operator. 
registered data and advantage. This organization, which already has an exclusive right on the urgent transport market, by also allowing them to provide such services that they can exclusively. Now, just to pick up on, 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 on the importance of the consultation point, we can go back to the Advocate General in the previous tab. Yes. So this, this is yet another case where the court overruled the Advocate General on, on the very point at issue in this case. And it starts at paragraph 158 of Advocate General Jacobs' opinion. So his conclusion, in contrast to the court, was that there was no violation of Article 106. And it's paragraph 160, 161 I want to pick up on. He says, uh, it is true, 160, they have an economic interest in the outcome of the authorization procedure, but they have a right only to be consulted, of course, authorization procedure, and the final decision is taken by the public authorities alone, not to suggest that the land price is bound by the factual statement of recommendation of the Fair Trade Organization. And 161, the land price enjoys no discretion decision, uh, subject to full judicial review, for those are two important further safeguards. And then 162, he says, in those circumstances, no violation of 161. But as we saw paragraph 43, the court has expressly rejected that, and found that the right to consultation is sufficient to engage on part of the 106. So it may be just be me, but could you just simplify your proposition in relation to paragraph 43? Well, we saw in the RGT case that where there is a right of regulation of approval, uh, that can give rise to a, to a conflict of interest. The point I'm seeking to make on the back of that, Ms. Glockner, is that a, a weaker right of consultation that was not binding, um, and in respect of which uh, the, the public authority retained full and unilateral discretion, that was nonetheless su sufficient in terms of an advantage give rise to a conflict of interest and a distortion of competition. So it, it is a widening of the case law, the concept of an advantage in a conflict of interest uh, context. You say the present case would be a fortiori yes. because there's a requirement of a guarantee. Yes. And indeed, I mean, what, what, one can test it in the following way. So in Ambulance Glockner, the, the incumbents operated at the emergency transport level and the renewal concerned the, the non-emergency transport, um, the pa patient transport market, which was a different market. Now, imagine the renewal in that case concerned not, not just Ambulance Glockner, but also the, the other two undertakings. So that there, were, there were three undertakings applying for renewal. Imagine if the state measure was that two of the three undertakings got to have a say on whether the other one should be granted a license or not. We say that that, that would clearly be in this case, your Lordship is quite right. It, it wasn't merely a, a right of consultation. Uh, of course, there was public consultation in relation to this process. It, it was something much more specific. And it was that if the ENR scheme is the winning scheme of the competition, would you, the competitor, implement it? So in my submission, that, that is something uh, much more insidious. And uh, it, it is really something uh, which is more significant than a right of consultation. A um, couple, of, couple of final authorities, if I may. Uh, this time it's an authority to. Yes. Case. It's the MOTOE case, tab 19. See paragraphs two and three. So the ELPA, which is an organization of Greeks, they, they had a dual role. They were responsible, so paragraph two, responsible for the organization of motorsports competitions. And then paragraph three, MOTUE, an independent motorcycle association, came to feel the effects of ELPA's dual role. And MOTUE sought to organize its own responsibility in other motorcycle events 
Greece he obtained no authorization to report it because Elpa did not declare its consent to, to the conflict to the conflict authority. Um, so so they, they had both the regulatory role in their own right and the possibility to consent to other uh, competing events being organized by, by competing uh, organizations. And we can then go forward to paragraph 88 of the opinion. <coughs> So, in essence, my lords, the point made here by the African General is that a, uh, a, a purely objective safety related role, a right of consultation, that would not itself violate Article 106. And I, I invite your lordships to, to read quickly, particularly 89 uh, and 1991. So it's a short form. Yes, safety has an objective justification aspect yeah, to it. Yes, yeah, yes. So if, if, if there's a safety regulator, uh, that's one thing. But then over the page of 97, she, she goes on to, to look at a different situation. She says, irrespective of whether any use actually exists, it is sufficient for the purpose of establishing infringement of the now article 1061 in conjunction with 102. The state measure merely creates a risk present case, the risk that Elpa will abuse his dominant position in exercising his right of co-decision uh, is particularly high for two reasons. First, rules and consent such as those in question here lead to a conflict of interest. Elpa, which itself organizes and markets motorcycle events, leads in the Greek stage right of co-decision on the authorization of motorcycle events of other independent service providers. Uh, but thus, not only has the legal means allowed effectively to prevent other service providers from entering the Greek market, also has an economic interest in limiting access to the market by its competitors to its own, own advantage. And then the second feature, secondly, Elpa is not subject under those rules of consent to any restriction, obligations, or controls in relation to the grant of consent in relation to the authorization of society events. It makes it particularly easy for Elpa to refuse to give consent, uh, and so on. And in my submission, both of these aggregating features are present in the present case. In the present case. Uh, HAL is a competing scheme to the uh, HUB scheme. And in, in giving the guarantee, in requesting the guarantee, it was requested in an entirely open ended manner. And what the Secretary of State did not do was seek to regulate a ring fence, what, what might be termed uh, legitimate concerns, for reasons of commercial self interest. It was an entirely open ended guarantee that could be uh, refused to <coughs> HAL essentially at its, at, at its width. And the African General distinguishes the uh, role of a legitimate regulator under safety uh, from these uh, two aggravating situations. And in my submission, both features are present in the present case. On your submission, would there be any legal control, either in public law or in private law, on Hal's ability to refuse to give that guarantee? Well, the, the, the fundamental problem is that while the competition is pending, there is an unavoidable conflict of interest. Right. Once you have a winner of the competition, then how does incentives fundamentally change? Because at that stage, if they are unwilling to implement Hub's bid as the winner, the alternative is may well go to Gatwick. So the, the conflict of interest, once it is dissipated, at, at that stage, what one, what one can understand that how they may have different incentives. And certainly while the competition is pending, there, there is an, an, an inevitable conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah, competition law has to grapple with real world inevitable conflicts of interest, doesn't it? Uh, well, look, yes, uh, but... That's an entirely neutral observation that well, I just made. Yeah, yes. I mean, my, my, my solution is that it really is a temporal point. Yes. That at the point the conflict of interest is dissipated, yes. things may well be different. But while the conflict is pending, the uh, scope for a conflict of interest is, it is unavoidable. Well, you rec it, 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 is the approach this in, in, if you like, real world terms? You, you 
notice that conflict of interest. You know that it exists in the real world. <coughs> but you have to ignore it, put it to one side. Is that right? Until the competition is ended. Until the competition is ended. And th this, of course, dovetails with Mr. Kingston's submissions, which is yes. uh, um, until the new Secretary of State came along after the 2016 referendum, um, the idea that how would be receptive to a competing bid during the competition was perfectly understood by everyone. And prior to and during the statement of principles, it was clear to all concerned that the stage at which to address the, the, the prospect of how it would be bid after the competition had concluded, yes. and not during. And with, with respect, that, that is a common sense point. And just to pick up where the court has, has endorsed uh, what we've just seen there in general, it's in paragraph 97 in the next tab. How does the paragraph begin? I think that's the point I was making just now. Is that right? So right. The, so the, the formula is essentially a structural one. Uh, one has to look at the position, the, 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 the structure of competition on the market at the time the state measure comes into force. And nothing in the judgment we have seen considers the extent to which the state actually took into account the conflict of interest consideration that it had created with the state measure. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. As we saw in the OTT case, the mere possibility that a conflict of interest could arise is sufficient because of that structural that problem in the market. Because if there's a conflict of interest, there might be an incentive to shade things and skew it in your, in your direction, oh, yeah. in your favour, using other object, ostensibly objective reasons like safety and so on. That's well, why it has to be a firm rule. Well, yes. The, so the, the, the legal obligation, think of this in terms of Section 31 of the Planning Act. 13 one. one. of the Planning Act. Yes, not 31, 13 one. 31, well, yes. Thank you. Um, I mean, one could look at this essentially as a failure on the part of the Secretary of State to guarantee equality of opportunity. Or one could look at the state measure as having positively created the scope of the conflict of interest. And you're not just perfectly right. So, so the, the, the reason for the rule is not some sort of competition fundamentalism. It is a pragmatic thing. Because once you have someone who has a dual role as a competitor and someone being consulted to give consent, uh, the scope for disentangling good, bad, or indifferent reasons in that structure is deeply problematic. And in a sense, my lords, one sees it with this case, where we're now pouring over reams of materials 
figure out what, what were the real reasons and did they take this into account for the good reason. But the, the reason for this strict principle of law is a deterrent function. And the reason the state has a, has a clear obligation not to create these conflicts in the first place <laughs> is that once they are created, trying to unscramble the object is a practice next, ne next to impossible. And so one could almost think of these as, as, a, as a type of object infringement, and that the, the need for demonstration of actual effects or even problem effects is not necessary because of the inherently problematic nature of the conflict of interest structures. So that is the bias, and that is why the legal principles is expressed in, in, in pretty strident um, terms. And in, in, in my submission, what one sees is very clearly in the judgment itself. Um, if I can invite your lordships to, to turn up the judgment. Anybody else? It's in Are we leaving the authorities now? Oh, yes. <coughs> so, in our submission, the, the, the error committed by the Division of Court in this regard <coughs> is all more glaring because, at multiple points in its own judgment, it has it, itself identified and accepted but how may well have been able to bring reasons of commercial self-interest to bear. I can just uh, give the court references. Start at 138, subparagraph 3. Secretary of State made his request other than seeking insurance, which he must have known, and could not provide. Secretary of State was seeking to explore at least facilitate the exploration of the potential <coughs> objection in all schemes. Mm -hmm. As been described, these objections were not simply commercial. The power onto the scheme that was promotedly chosen were based on objective concerns. And then the same point of paragraph. 35. <coughs> the Humphrey stress that the House preference to the NWR scheme is not based on purely commercial self interest. 1984. one has within the judgment itself a series of clear findings that the structure created by the Secretary of State allowed both reasons of commercial self-interest and potentially objective reasons to be advanced without any You're possible... You're going slightly too fast, I'm afraid. Oh, so. Forgive me. So, in my submission, we have seen, based on the four passages I have shown you in the that within the judgment itself, the court recognized and accepted that the guarantee provided scope for reasons of both <coughs> commercial self-interest, which would be conflict of interest reasons, and uh, apparently objective reasons, to be brought to bear at the same time. And the aggravating feature of this guarantee is that there was no uh, possibility or facility which allowed these good, bad, and indifferent reasons to be disentangled. And, and there, there is an inconsistency between the judgment on the one hand, accepting that this guarantee created scope for reasons of commercial self-interest to be advanced, 
then on the other hand, uh, failing to recognize the consequence of that or for a potential distortion of competition. central legal proposition based on the authorities I've shown you in terms of the mistakes <coughs> by the division court. So the, the first proposition is that the division court's analysis is looking too late in the process. The inequality of opportunity or conflict of interest crystallized at the point PAL was requested to give the guarantee on the 17th of August 2016. By asking for the guarantee, the Secretary of State created the inequality of opportunity which, as a matter of EU law, is impermissible. The Division of the Court was therefore wrong to focus on what happened after the request was made. <coughs> and the, the second point, which is really the flip side of the same coin, is that the Division of the Court wrongly focused on the subsequent lack of actual effect. Well, that's a separate point, actually. I think that... that that's not merely the flip side. That's that has an, an, an added element to it. Well, I, I see that. One can look at it both ways. So, if, if, if I'm correct that the distortion crystallizes at yeah. uh, on the 17th of August, yes. the fact that there is no subsequent further effect is neither here nor there. Yeah. And likewise, one can express this in a different way, which is the absence of an actual effect after the 17th of August that is equally immaterial. Yes, yes. They're largely the same thing in obverse, aren't they? Thank you. Yes? Well, um, that was all I proposed to say in relation to round one. Thank you. Um, Uh, uh, two final points. I will deal with ground one and have a very short point, uh, which you may have picked up about some mechanisms which are related to the disability of this one. It's a very short point. All right. But I'm well on track. Well, if you finish ahead of time, you'll be the first to have done so. <laughs> Don't you? At the risk of sounding like teaching. I will do my best. That is a status that is to be prized. <laughs> You and Mr. Kingston together will have finished ahead of time. Perhaps I should have said it. <laughs> we we, we aged things. <coughs> well, round two, if we can go back uh, briefly to the judgment just to remind ourselves of the essential findings we saw uh, the lunch.
Um, so in essence, what the Division of Court finds is that it would only be after the applications for DTOs were made and determined that the structure of competition in the market would be affected. And this, of course, is the point pressed by Mr. Bannon for the war. Now, my submission, that is plainly a bad point for three reasons. First and most importantly, it aligns the distinction between two distinct phases of the selection process. The first stage was what scheme for expansion in the southeast of England should be selected. <coughs> that stage has completed with the designation of the AMPS, and the government has determined that that scheme is the end of the war. That is the decision which Hub complains about. Hub scheme was not selected, how's what? And instead of focusing on uh, this point, the Division of Court instead focused on the second stage, which is with the NWR scheme having been designated, would it be possible for someone in addition to how to play a role in how's scheme? In other words, the Division of Court's answer to the question of distortion of competition at the first stage appears to be to say, uh, don't worry, because in due course, someone else might gain development consent to build NWR at the second stage. But in our submission, that is a non sequitur. Competition for the scheme is over, has been definitively determined in favour of how. The restriction of competition by virtue of selection of schemes has already happened. And no possible outcome at the DCO stage can cure that. Indeed, there is an air of unreality about this position. Even now, the outcome of the DCO process is entirely unknown and will not be known for some years. And by the Division of Court's logic, one would have to wait for several years after the designation decision to figure out whether there was a distortion of competition at all. We said this is bizarre and clearly incorrect. And one, one can test the Division of Court's findings by references to the cases we've just seen. Uh, suppose in the RTT case, the incumbent RTT said that Inno's case failed because RTT was willing to allow somebody other than Inno to resell RTT's approved equipment. Uh, we asked rhetorically, would that have made a difference to the analysis? We, we say, of course not. The objection was based on conflict of interest, not a mitigation of a conflict of interest by giving a competitor a slice of the action. And again, take Ambulance Lochner. Suppose that the undertakings recommended that Ambulance Lochner should not have a license renewal, said that they would be willing to subcontract part of their operations to a third party. Would that have led to a different conclusion? We'd say, we'd say plainly not. The second reason is, although the question of who gets a development consent order is in theory open, the reality is that HAL is going to have a major, if not sole, promotion role. The assessment of the NWR proceeded on the basis that it would be delivered and financed by HAL. The project had been described by the former chief executive of the CAA as the largest privately financed infrastructure project anywhere in the world. There is no real prospect that that project is going to be developed by somebody other than HAL. Selection of the NWR did entail the selection of HAL as the principal, if not exclusive, delivery agent or promoter. And indeed, that is a point which has been recognized uh, by the Secretary of State and Department of Transport themselves on a number of occasions. We can just give you two references. First is to the third supplemental document. Tab 52. Yes. So th this is from the Secretary of State. I invite your lordships to, to, to look at under paragraph 3. All right, so this is what this is, is a, the 7th of March 2018. And it seems to be an internal note to the Secretary of State from his civil servants yeah. uh, discussing the, the scope for alternative promoters and stakeholder handling. Yeah. And uh, on the paragraph 3, Roman number 1, note the unique 
unique status of has with regard to any application for DCO at Heathrow Airport. You know, this unique status provides the rationale for engagement with HAL as opposed to, to other promoters who might promote a scheme at Heathrow on, on the delivery of the Dublin version of the scheme. <coughs> the second reference in the same document, tab 55. So this is June 18. And this is the relationship framework document. Department of Transport. And it's 2.4 page 1034. Yes. So it says, unless you have a relation with Heathrow, the problem of that Heathrow is currently the only credible promoter that is able to deliver the scheme in its entirety, either in itself or in, or in collaboration with others. And then at 2.5.1 on the same page, they figure the reasons how is the owner and operator of the airport. 2.52. Another party would need to acquire the records of land and rights over land from Heathrow, compulsory in order to the scheme. And it mentions public interest considerations militating against that. So, in our submission, it is plain in common sense that if the MWR scheme is to be promoted for Heathrow, the sole or certainly predominant promoter will inevitably be HAL. You mentioned that the head of the CAA referred to it as the biggest infrastructure project in the world. Have you got that reference for us for that? I would get that. Thank you. Well, it's supplementary volume two, tab 49. Thank you. And the third and final reason, which, which uh, flows from the second point I've made, is that if one takes Mr. Banner's case at its highest, uh, all he is saying is that Aurora, or perhaps somebody else, may play some role in respect of the NWR scheme. It, it is not being suggested, it cannot be suggested, that Aurora or anybody else would fully displace how in respect of the NWR scheme. And that is why we say it cannot be an answer to the distortion of competition by virtue of the guarantee at the, uh, on the 17th of August 2016 to say that at some unspecified point in the future, uh, somebody in addition to how may get a slice of the action. Aurora own um, how much of the land? Well, that, that, that may be a better question than Mr. Banner. I'll, I'll provide you with the precise amount. I believe it's about 40%. About 40%. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you the exact figure if I can. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned before last, it, it, it is mainly a bad point in law anyway, because the idea that I can distort competition at, at point A, that is mitigated by uh, some promotion of competition 10 years later, Nonsensical. It's your temporal point. Yeah. Um, Actually, the temporal point is really the governing point all the way through, isn't it? Well, yes. Um, all, all these submissions come back to that crystallization uh, moment. Well, as I, as I hope I've shown you, Lord Chess, we'll see what Mr. Palmer says. But uh, we've given, I think, eight or nine references in our first sketch to, to the conflict of interest principle. 
And what is striking about the Secretary of State's submission thus far is he has been unable to come up with a single pathology which controverts my point that the distortion of, comp of competition in a conflict of interest situation crystallizes the moment that the state measure creates a conflict of interest. And just to remind you, we now have two cases, RTT and Ambulance Lockwood, where the Advocate General said, well, look, surely you're not saying that the mere possibility that there might be a conflict of interest is sufficient under Article 4. Well, the court says emphatically, yes. And Ambulance Lockwood is an upgrade because they said, well, surely you're not suggesting that the mere right of consultation in a non binding capacity where the decision maker is, is an independent public body infringes Article 106. Well, the court again says, yes, we are. So the, 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 there's really no, no counterweight has been put to date to uh, what I submit are eight or nine authorities which are banned on the court. And we haven't had any response to, to that particular point. We, we'll wait to see with interest what, what Mr. Farmer says. Finally, more than five minutes on, on the admissibility point. Uh, can I just give you a, a handful of references? So our central submission is that the respondent's notice points on dominance and objective justification uh, should not be open to the Secretary of State and the interveners. If, if I can ask your Lordship first to turn to the core, core bundle, which is the, the agreed list of issues for the proceedings below. Volume 4, tab 13. So 2145, you will see that this is the agreed list of issues before the provisional board. <coughs> so page 2145. Core bundle 4, tab 13, page 2145. Okay. At 2146 on the paragraph 3, you will see listed the issues before the provisional board. They were A, state measure, B, special exclusive rights, and C, risk of abuse of dominance. And what you do not see there is any uh, identification of dominance as being a, a separate issue of dispute or, or indeed objective justification. Second reference, this time in the third supplemental bundle, well, it may be New Lordship Slim bundle, but one of the documents uh, added in the last couple of days. Well, we've kept those in the slender bundles. Well, it's a nice 66A. Oh, let's say the Lordship's number. 66A. Yes, it's at the back of our slim volume. And it's towards the end. So, so this is the order of Mr. Justice Hallgate uh, in the case management. So that there was a, a specific and an unusual order. No party may advance any argument, whether in their skeleton or the hearing, of these claims, which has not been set out in their pleadings today. And this was an unusual order, which uh, in fact was sought at the insistence of the Secretary of State. And finally, before I sit down, if I could just show you the pleadings that relate to this order. Um, Would that order preclude this court from receiving any such argument? Well, that, that, that is my disability objection. Well, let me show you the two pleadings and I will, mm -hmm. I will make the submission. Um, it, 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 so we're bound by an order of the High Court? Well, no, it, it's, it, it's really a question of substantial injustice because one of the points made against me is, well, uh, there is no evidence on dominance. But that, that, is, that is an unfair point because... I'm sorry, I should have said a case management order made by the High Court. Yes. But well, it, it is profoundly unfair to criticise Hull for not having evidence on dominance when the issue of dominance was not in this let me just show you, Lordship, the pleadings. 
um, which follow along from this author. And it's in core volume four. Well, the suspicion is it's not fair to admit it. Well, no, it's, it's more than that, in my sense. It's that it, it is, there's a substantial risk of injustice. Because if the point is taken against me, well, wh where is the evidence on dominance? The, the reason there's no evidence on dominance yes. is that point is not in dispute. And, and, and as I will show your lordship, in fact, had been conceded. Let, let me just show you the pleadings. It's in core volume four. Tab 13. The business secretary states um, the detailed grounds of defence. <coughs> Page uh, 2249. Right, I ask your lordships to start at 2264, which is, which is ground one below. submission on dominance. And then if one goes to paragraph 50, the Secretary states that Hazard does not face competition in the market for supplying airport services at Heathrow. They, they go on, in fairness, to give an explanation to do with regulation. Uh, but the point of dominance was not only not taken, but what we say ha had been conceded. Just to give you the, the reference to Hal's own defence, it's in core volume, same volume, tab 13, 2241. But it's referring there to services at Heathrow, not southeast of England. Well, yes, but it, it, in the context of, of that defence, it's, it's the same thing. No point is taken either in relation to that non Heathrow market. The the divisional court came to the conclusion that the market was broader southeast of England, but you say it was on the basis that Heathrow was was dominant. Oh, yeah. well, so it's the same point. That is Hal's point in response to notice. I'll deal with that. What wants to throw it in there? Well, the, the simple answer to your question is it, it doesn't matter whether you regard the market as Heathrow or the southeast of England, they're dominant. <laughs> We will deal with that. Um, so the how pleading at 2241. Um, so it starts at paragraph 12, which is the competition grounds. And again, I invite your lordship to peruse that. Uh, but there is, there is no pleading in the how pleading either that uh, challenging the question of dominance or, or indeed objective justification. say at this stage. I mean, it is fair to point out my points that these points were mentioned in all the submissions before the division court. And the division court does report uh, our discomfort in having to deal with these points for the first time at the hearing. But the respondent's notice is having been submitted. I am making in my perspective submission on title to me on grounds of substantial injustice and a disability challenge that should not be open to, to the Secretary of State. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Donoghue. Yes. Mr. Palmer.
firstly, that the Secretary of State accepted the recommendation of the Independent Airports Commission that the North West Runway was to be preferred over the ENR, the Extended Northern Runway. Secondly, that there were objective reasons for that conclusion that the NWR would generate the greatest net benefits to the UK, in particular greater economic and strategic benefits. And there was no good reason identified at any point to depart from that recommendation, despite extensive review. And the gathering of new evidence. And thirdly, that against that background, it was immaterial whether or not any assurance was <coughs> or was not obtained by HUB from HUB about uh, commitment to work delivery of the ENR. At that point would only have been a material factor in the decision if good reason had been found to prefer the ENR over the NWR on its objective merits. But that was manifestly not the case. And an important theme of my submissions will be that it's important to distinguish between the time before that ultimate judgment <coughs> of objective merit was made and the time after that ultimate judgment on the objective merit was made. Because before that conclusion had been reached, as the Secretary of State has accepted throughout, the presence or absence of any kind of assurance or support for putting us how to work with the ENR scheme was treated as a potentially material consideration which could be relevant to the decision. But at the point when the Secretary of State finally accepted the AC's recommendation and said yes, the NWR is, on its planning merits, on its objective merits, the better scheme objectively, then how likely or how difficult it would or wouldn't have been for HUB to develop their scheme in cooperation with HAL, or rather for HAL to develop HUB's scheme, having purchased IP rights from HAL, became irrelevant to the decision making at that point. When do you say that point was? After, or at and after, the meeting of the Cabinet subcommittee on the date of the preference decision. The calendar date would help us. That was the 26th of October, 2016. Okay. So 25th. 25th, I'm corrected. 25th of October, 2016. Uh, <coughs> yes. So you used the concept of a potentially material consideration. What I mean your by that? Well, just pausing. Your, your submission is going to be, is it, that the evidence demonstrates that it was not regarded as a material consideration, it was regarded as a potentially material consideration? Well, I, I need to be perfectly precise about my terminology. There's no confusion. Well, that's why I'm asking you the in question. In my submission, there is confusion about this. On, on, on well, you're going to need to dispel that confusion. I'm, I'm going to do that now, if I may. There is a difference between identifying as something as a relevant consideration in law, that is, in the ex parte viewing sense, a matter which can lawfully be taken into account yeah. by the decision maker. There's a difference between that on the one hand, and on the other hand, a consideration, a relevant consideration, which was then in the making of the decision treated as 
material in the sense that it had a bearing on the outcome. So if I use the terminology of relevant consideration for the first, and material, I use the word material or immaterial in the second, but I should emphasize that in the pleadings and the documents, because lawyers often talk about relevant considerations as material considerations, uh, irrelevant considerations, immaterial, that language is used interchangeably, and that is one of the sources of confusion. Right. What would help us most, perhaps at this stage, would be to nail down in the authorities the best uh, exposition of this distinction which you say is central. The distinction you've just drawn. Well, the distinction I've made is one between law and fact. No, no, that I understand. Um, where is this best articulated at high level in the authorities? We'll, we'll try and nail down if, there's, if that distinction is clearly nailed down. But, uh, well, can you do it now? Not immediately. I can't find an authority which... Does, but my but this, is, this is a central submission for you, isn't it? It is a central submission. That there is a difference between something which is recognised as being potentially relevant as opposed to the amount of weight which is put on it. And if the answer is no weight is ultimately put on it, <coughs> then it becomes immaterial to the actual decision. What's the authority for that proposition? Well, that, that's just my, my submission. I know it is. That's why that. I'm asking you what the authority for it is. I can't give you authority for it. Because I, my submission is it must be right where no weight is put on a particular relevant consideration in reaching a decision. It is perfectly right to say, well, that was immaterial to the outcome. You say it's a process of analysis, yeah. it's a process on, of analysis. on the facts. It's not, a, it's not such a legal proposition, it's just a logical one. It's something to which no weight is attached. It, it can be fairly described as immaterial to the decision. That's not to say it would have been an error of law had the decision maker attached significant weight to it. Is a relevant consideration in law, that's up to the decision maker and how much weight to put on it. But on the facts of this case, once, I emphasize once, the judgment is reached on the objective merits of the scheme, that point, how assured can we be of the delivery of the EMR, is neither here nor there. Does your submission <coughs> in any way depend on the distinction between subjective and objective? Not the distinction I've just made. No. I, I will have a point about that distinction later on, but that's not. Yeah. Um, the point I've just made is not dependent on that distinction. Yes, I only ask because in, in that most recent formulation you, you talked about the objective merits. Yeah. The, the, the point I'm making now mm. is, is independent of that. Yes, I see. And um, I just want to show you some of what I, I mean. Uh, first of all, by reference to the judgment, I'm just keeping these references fairly quickly because I know that the now, by now has, has seen many of this. But in connection with this point, judgment, paragraph 81. And uh, when we 
use for that. Now, we're halfway down paragraph five, beginning whilst clearly the Secretary of State was alive to having to consider the recommendations of the AC with an open mind. It is clear from the contemporaneous documents to understand that he was minded to follow the AC's recommendations, subject to any material or representation that might suggest that it was ill-founded. He found no such material. There does not appear to have been any. The Secretary of State could not sensibly have bucked the recommendation of the AC unless he had good reason to do so. There was no such reason. I invite the court's attention to paragraph 6 and 7 as well, but ending at 8. Even if Howe had responded positively, oh, sorry, at the top of the page, still on 6, in fact, I should do that first, at the very top of the page, in 6. The fact is that the AC's recommendation was not departed from because there was no good reason to do so. Uh, and then uh, at 8. Even if Howe had responded positively to the request, the commitment, this would have made no difference to the outcome because it could not have improved the objective merits of the ENRP, which had been judged for short of the objective merits of the NWR scheme by, by comparison. So, where are you reading from? That last bit was Roman 8. Sorry, yes. <coughs> are, are you submitting, in effect, that there was an anterior decision? Was there any reason to depart from the objective merits? If not, then you never go any further. Well, in a sense, as a matter of decision making, one, you've got to adjust, come to a view on the objective merits <coughs> first. Yes, well, I'm going to show you the decision making process in some detail. But, but the broad outline of it was the AC, as an independent commission, considered all three schemes. I mean, narrowed the shortlist down to three schemes, consider those two schemes in some detail on their objective merits, produce a recommendation. The Secretary of State then, first of all, uh, analysed that decision making to see if the evidence base was robust and could be relied upon. Uh, he was shown in the review and he found that it could be relied upon. Uh, the second thing he did was to probe further, uh, in particular, commission further evidence uh, and see if that disturbed any of the conclusions. Uh, and the third thing he did was then to accept the recommendation on those merits at a point of time where, on the facts, when one goes back to the reports, there is nothing to suggest that any good reason had been identified to overturn or, or dispute or depart from that recommendation, in particular, the finding that it had the greatest economic and strategic Well, before benefits. we, sorry, before we embark on this journey through the facts, um, let's know again what these mileposts are on our journey. Um, you've just told us what they are. Could you kindly repeat those stages for us? So yes. We have a clear note of them. In fact, I'm going to deal with facts in, in, by reference to five uh, milestones. So right, five milestones. Let, let's get a note of these five milestones. The first is as to the independent airport commissions assessment of the merits of the scheme, which I say was on its objective, on their objective merits. We know that that led to a clear, that unanimous recommendation of the commission that the NWR is the scheme with the greatest economic and strategic benefits. That's the first part. The second uh, was that the, um, um, as part of that, I should say, that, 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 that uh, those conclusions and that evidence base was validated by the Secretary of State, who assured himself that it was a soundly based recommendation based on robust evidence. And what does that validation amount to? Um, Provisional view no. or something stronger? No, not at that stage. It was not a provisional view taken. It was just looking at what the AC had considered. Had they left something out? Had they failed to look at something? Is there some problem in the evidence base? Some problem in the analysis? The answer was it was given a, a clean bill of health. And so, <coughs> um, 
the evidence base could be relied upon. At that stage, that didn't mean that they accepted the recommendation. There was no decision to accept the recommendation at that stage. And this is your second stage. You said as part of this, yes. but it, the airport commission was independent, yes. came up with its report on date X. Exactly. But subsequent, uh, subsequently, the Secretary of State validated that uh, subsequent, yes. as a process. Yes. The next is that the um, uh, Secretary it would be, I'm so sorry, Mr. Palmer. It would be useful to have some broad dates, at least, for these milestones. Well, um, Just broadly. Is that easy to do? Well, I, I, I will certainly provide the data as I go through. All right, yes. Well, you do, do it that way. Maybe a short chronology with your five stages would be very helpful over the next the next stage was the, uh, what's known as the uh, statement of principles stage, the SOP stage. Yes. <clears throat> and this was a process of engagement with each of the scheme promoters to help assist the Secretary of State's understanding of each of the schemes and in particular, relevant for present purposes, to understand how it would be proposed that they be delivered. What promoters' proposals were. So that there could be some assurance, amongst other things, as to the deliverability of the promised schemes. So it's not a beauty contest on paper had to be a scheme which could actually, in real life, be delivered on, on the ground to fulfill the identified need for capacity. The Secretary of State should be met in the public interest. Within a time scale. Within a time scale. The third stage was leading up to and including the preference decision. That the fourth, fourth stage. Oh, the fourth, I'm sorry, I've missed that one. Yeah. Leading up to the preference decision. <clears throat> yes. That was the stage at which the um, uh, assurance, commitment uh, was requested in August 2016. And that preference decision was on the 25th of October. That preference decision was, as it had to be under the Planning Act, subject to consultation. And one of the specific questions as it had to be, uh, in the consultation was, do you agree that the NWR should be the preferred location for delivery of airport capacity? That was consulted upon uh, extensively. There were two rounds of consultation, in fact, other consultations. Uh, so that is the fifth stage, the undertaking the consultation. Uh, and that includes further receipt of material on the merits in relation to the scheme, relevantly for our purposes, from HUB in relation to the ENR scheme, seeking to overcome dispute the identified benefits of the NWR scheme. I'll come to this, but in essence they were saying these benefits which you say the NWR scheme has over our scheme are illusory. They don't exist. <coughs> and there was a very thorough consideration of those representations, including the further commissioning of independent expert evidence on behalf of the Secretary of State. Also, running alongside, on oh, the same stage, if you like, running alongside the public consultation was a parliamentary process. Again, required under the Planning Act, as I'm sure you will see by the stage of the chair, so I will go to it. Uh, 
uh, and that included the report of the Transport Committee, which accepted the Secretary of State's recommendation for the NWR on the objective merits. Parliamentary vote. Uh, and of course, then finally, the um, following vote in favour of uh, the decision of the Secretary of State to designate <coughs> the NWPS after the conclusion of the whole process. Mr. Palmer, so thank you. Mr. Palmer, had you finished on that topic? I, I, well, you're providing those headings, yes. yes. Yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to go back, if I may, to the Divisional Court's judgment at paragraph 138, which you showed us. Yes. <coughs> and you showed us, amongst other passages, in Roman 8. Yes. At the end of it. This would have made no difference to the outcome. And we didn't, I think, specifically look at it, but if we look at seven, they make a point there that we do not consider the ENR schemes in any way prejudiced. Yes. I'm just wondering whether concepts like prejudice and wouldn't have made any difference to the outcome are really appropriately taken into account at this stage of the analysis, because they, they're redolent of the sort of factors that the court sometimes takes into account in deciding whether a remedy should be granted or not. Um, I understand the point, but the answer, the answer to it is yes, it should be taken into account at this stage. Yes. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because <coughs> what the court is doing is analysing what the Secretary of State, what the government cabinet subcommittee decisions were, as in what was actually driving them, what were they in substance. And I will show you this. It, it is that, that it all turns on the assessment of the objective mer merit of these two schemes, which allows the court to say, by that stage, again, that background, the acceptance of that recommendation, the agreement, the positive endorsement of the of one scheme is objectively better than the other, allows it to say, therefore, this further factor cannot have affected that decision either way. But suppose it did, even if it was a thoroughly bad reason. I'm not saying it was, but just assume that there is a thoroughly bad reason, which, in fact, is taken into account by the decision maker. But everything else is, is the same as this case. So you have the objective merits couldn't have been improved. You have an independent commission which has recommended this objectively to the decision maker. But, but in fact, the decision maker says to himself, in reaching this decision, I take into account not only these objective factors, but also that I don't like the colour of your hair, or I don't like the colour of your skin. How does public law address that problem? On a fact-sensitive basis, if there was even one reason going the other way, <coughs> there was a good reason, let's just imagine that there was a good reason to depart from the recommendation. So the question is, well, how much weight should we put on that good reason? Is it strong enough to lead us to depart from recommendation or not? And if in that context they, they took into account a thoroughly bad reason, by which I take my law against an unlawful consideration, an irrelevant consideration, yes. uh, and balance one against the other, then that would be an unlawful decision. Uh, and then would be in the sole question of, of relief, and, and whether or not it's very likely that uh, the same decision but there's a different case here, which is where all the reasons which were given in the draft NPS, the NPS, uh, of which the Secretary of State consulted, put out to the public to say, this is what justifies my decision. Uh, it's put out before, part, late before Parliament, this is what justifies my decision. And those are found to be good reasons. Uh, 
we now know that they are. Um, if on top of all of that there was also a bad reason, an unlawful reason, mm. then in my submission that cannot uh, affect the lawfulness uh, of the uh, decision. Uh, and there is authority for that. Indeed, you were, you were shown it earlier uh, in the um, <coughs> uh, agreed uh, list of main issues and uh, propositions of, of law. It was a uh, bundle, core bundle four, tab ten. Narrative. Uh, no, it, on, on the uh, uh, paragraph seven, top of page one six five three. Uh, oh, I, think, yeah. I think we're in the wrong tab. Sorry, one, oh, one six five three. I, I'm on page one six five two three. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you were showing this earlier, but the very bottom of one six five two, if the SST. Uh, in designating the AMPS, had regard to an irrelevant matter. His decision may be unlawful even if the irrelevant matter was not the sole or even the dominant influence. It is sufficient if the irrelevant matter was treated by him as material or substantial. And then these context, in that context, the word material or substantial go, with, go to weight rather than to relevance. It's not saying it's sufficient. An irrelevant matter was treated as a relevant consideration. Well, you're arguing for the one inverse as, proposition. As being material. So, so, so that is perhaps as close as I'm going to come to meeting my Lord's challenge, but we'll be looking at specifically the authority on that further. We cited judicial uh, Smith, which we have in the bundle. You, you say this is orthodox analysis. <laughs> the ultimate question is materiality. Yes. If in fact huh. it wasn't material, yes. then it's game over. And if in fact it was, then and it, and it was irrelevant. Yeah. Well, then you're into question of remedy, of course. Yes, we must be careful yeah. to distinguish between the true legal concept of materiality and the true legal concept of weight. Yes. Otherwise, we will get ourselves confused. Um, I think we should look at what <coughs> Smith says on this question. Smith is in the authority uh, bundle four. It's so obvious. Yeah, on the basis of that, it wasn't thought to be in dispute, and it's not. But, um, but, it's, but, it, but it isn't so obvious. We need to see what's not in dispute. Yes. We'll provide that to you. And I think, Mr. Palmer, if I may say so, if there's any authority which is cited by the Smith, I think that this, this may be sufficiently important that we should be reminded of what that authority is. But, but, but can, I, can I ask you this? I, maybe, maybe I'm being too slow. But this sentence that you've just reminded us of is actually the very sentence that Mr. Kingston relies on yeah. against you. He, yeah. he said that is precisely the legal <coughs> fault which has occurred here that the Secretary of State. In fact, he doesn't. Um, oh. I don't think he says he does, but I'll explain why he doesn't. In right. fact, the first one is that's because there's a dispute between us as to whether this was material to the decision or not. He says it was material and therefore. Um, well, no, isn't that the, sufficient to treat it? Forgive me, isn't the burden of that sentence on the point that it was treated by the decision maker? This is my point about <coughs> what everyone accepts. That's why one I know, I know what, what, we, we choose extreme examples but precisely because they help to test how far a legal principle goes. Uh, if everyone accepts that, for example, the colour of your hair or the colour of your skin is irrelevant, but in fact a decision maker does treat it as one of the reasons why he's taking the decision that he is, then what follows? Well, that, 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 that would be right. I wouldn't dispute that. But I'd point out that in this case, the reasons given were for 
set out in the NPS, they were the objective reasons. Well, Mr. Kingston doesn't accept that. Oh, no, he he, he, he says that, that those are not the only reasons and that he's entitled, he may be wrong, but he, he says yeah, he's yeah. entitled to look at the entire decision-making process leading up to the ANPS, yeah. and if he can find uh, evidence that the Secretary of State in fact took into account something else, <coughs> then he says that that vitiates the decision. Now, he may be wrong about I, that. I say that, that, that's wrong in that sense, because yes. treated as material substantial, and I so you judge that not just by and to uh, look into the mind and subjective basis of, this, of the decision maker, but you look at what the logic of the decision is. Um, and if they fall one way, you can't possibly say that that's material or substantial problem. The, 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 the reason why this line of authority, though, has to be handled with considerable care, it, though, is that it's not, it's explicitly not my learned friend's case that this decision was vitiated by reason of the taking into account of an irrelevant consideration, independently of this point about EU competition law yes. and legitimate expectations. Yes. Leaving EU competition law to one side for a moment, because for a set of reasons, my submission to you will be this decision was not made in breach of EU competition law. If I'm wrong about that, well, I can see what else I said that are, but if I'm right about that, then you're left with the legitimate expectation part. And there is a reason why my learned friend puts it. And had always put it in terms of legitimate expectation. And that is that he had recognised that in law this was a potentially relevant consideration to take into account, which is why he needs, in his own case, to find the legitimate expectation, the source of the legitimate expectation, to say, even though in principle, as a matter of law, it would be relevant, I, the decision maker, am not going to take into account, or at least not going to take it into account at this stage of the process. Yes. Uh, and if it were irrelevant consideration on my first case, he wouldn't need it. Find any such legitimate expectation at all. You just say that that's, that's a matter of irrelevance. That's, that's not how he's put it. Uh, he's explicitly conceded that. It's recorded in the judgment uh, and to the court acknowledged that he was right. Uh, and, and, and he's, and he's very fairly said repeated. that to me this morning. Yes, yeah. He needs that for the logic of his argument. He needs that for the logic of his argument. So if in fact there is no source of legitimate expectation, yeah. Yeah. and if in fact there is no breach of EU competition, yeah. then firstly, this question of materiality. Ceases to be relevant. Uh, it is only if you can find a source of legitimate expectation uh, uh, and find and show that that legitimate expectation, whatever it was, was then breached, or, or only if the EU competition law depends on materiality to succeed, which one of of course, says it doesn't. Uh, but the point then becomes a full May I turn to the uh, ANPS before I go through that process, just to see where where we ended up? That's it. Uh, in Core Bundle, Volume 5, Tab 14. And first, within Tab 2, to page 200, uh, 2432. Runway. 
It takes you to chapter three, head of the government's preferred scheme for the North West Runway. And then 3.11 to 3.12, just to note a summary of the process uh, followed.
building on this assessment government has identified a number of attributes in the manner of strategic effects, which it believes only the preferred scheme is likely to deliver. So you the overall needs case for increased capacity. For the particular weights to these, again, the first bullet point picks up that point about connectivity, for the route network, particularly in terms of long-haul flights. And then the second bullet point benefits to passengers to the wider economy sooner, regardless of the technical challenges to its delivery, also the greatest boost to local jobs. The third point is about Ethereum Airport generally, so that would be common to both ENR and MWR. Fourth point, MWR scheme delivers the greatest support for freight, including <coughs> doubling of freight capacity at the airport. Uh, already have small freight comes to much. Again, that freight is, is particularly picked up in that previous video I showed you at 3.59. So just following that through. <coughs> 374, Heathrow uh, Northwest Runway Scheme is best placed to deliver this capacity, delivering the greatest benefits soonest, as well as providing the biggest boost to the UK's international productivity. So, the 20s. Then, taken together, benefits to passengers and the wider economy are substantial, even having regard to the proportionally greater environmental disbenefits estimated for the HFR and MWR. Uh, even though the preferred scheme is benef environmental benefits are larger than those of Gatwick, and all benefits and disbenefits are considered together, overall, the Heater and Northwest Runway Scheme is considered to deliver the greatest net benefits to the UK. Final paradox. Misunderstanding 
of the reason given in the AMPS at judgment 109 to 110. Again, when you read those, note again the link with capacity. So that, that difference in capacity in particular, uh, while respecting the need for respite, resilience, safety measures, it is one of the prime drivers of the evaluation of the economic and strategic benefits of, of the NWR scheme over the NR scheme. Well, that's just a simple, straightforward, linear uh, mapping. But the essential insight is when you have more capacity, more air traffic movements, more passengers, uh, you can derive more uh, economic benefits, but also more strategic <coughs> benefits in terms of maintaining a hub status. Is there any difference between 700,000 and 740,000? Yes, and that's all documented. Again, I don't want to take time over it now. Um, you can see the reasons given in the AMPS at 3.59 and 3.73 to 3.74. So, um, <coughs> that, that was considered to be a, a, a very great difference, in fact. Plus, there was doubt over whether 700,000 could be reached consistently with providing continued levels of assurance by respite and resilience. And also, the safety question raised further questions about as to whether it would be reached as well. I don't know what mitigation measures would be, so that might in fact reduce that assessed capacity further. So, those all fed into the assessment. Uh, so, there is the uh, finding on the reasons. And meanwhile, <coughs> evidence fell far short of establishing that the absence of a supposed formal written guarantee had had the force of a veto or had been treated as a failure to meet a binary precondition. And on that, can I give the references at uh, Judgment 57, Roman 1, 122, and 137, Roman 1. That is important because both in competition law terms, and we get to that, uh, and in terms of the nature of the treatment of this factor in the decision-making <coughs> process, when this case was originally brought, all Hub was saying was it was in there as a factor, in there as a material consideration, look, we can show you features in the report, and it was treated as a veto, and it was treated as a binary precondition which had not been met, so that was sufficient to knock us out. But that central plank of the original case has gone, it's no longer true. But I ask you to be cautious, and will ask you to be cautious when we get to Mr. Donahue's submission, there were moments when he sought to treat it as if it had been a black-white decision again, a right to prevent Hub from competing. You remember he said that the particular vice of the guarantee, was, was, there was no means of separating the good, bad reasons and indifferent reasons. So that would be true if a, if a lack of a guarantee or refusal to provide a guarantee or assurance had been treated as a knockout blow and no one looked behind that. It's not true when you come to see, well, what are the reasons how they're providing and what is, what are the merits of those reasons, which is what in fact happened. <coughs> when you use the term binary, what, what do you mean by that? Well, that was Hub's term, but what I answered them to mean is if there was no assurance from Hull then there could be no hub scheme with an effective veto. That's how it was originally put. Which has the same consideration. Yeah. Now, all of this, as I understand it, hub has now in principle recognised, the ground has shifted, and hub's case on the facts now is that the absence of an assurance was given material weight uh, alongside the otherwise valid <coughs> reasons for preferring the NWR scheme on its merits, on its objective merits. That's now for instance. But the central flaw in that argument, as I have already foreshadowed in the Lords, is that it is irreconcilable with the fact that both the AC and the Secretary of State ultimately preferred the NWR scheme because it delivered the greatest net economic and strategic benefits to the UK. And, and that is the reason <coughs> that there was no reduction in either the draft AMPS put out to consultation or in the proposed AMPS put before Parliament 
then designated, of any lack of an assurance that it would commit, that how would commit to the ENR scheme if it was preferred. Because that would be irrelevant at that point to the, to the conclusion by now definitively reached that the NWR scheme was objectively be the better scheme with the greatest net benefit. Okay. Logically, at that point, <coughs> the point has no role to play. You look back at that AMPS I've just shown you the chapter three, if at the end of it, <coughs> and what's more, if we preferred the ENR scheme, but we couldn't be sure if it would be brought forward by how, the obvious question would be, well, so what? You've already told us that the NWR scores better uh, across the board. Yes, um, if, if it were, in a sense, sequential in that way. Um, earlier on, you, you made the submission. Um, you referred to this as being a consideration that was in addition to, I think, the other considerations, or on top of. I forget the exact phrase, I can't find it. Yes, here it is. If on top of that um, there were, then you said, an unlawful reason, yes. um, it uh, could not affect the lawfulness of the decision itself. Not if it was incapable, rationally. So, so do your submissions hang on the concept of this being an additional extraneous factor? Yes. As to say, noticed but extraneous to the real decision making. Yes. Is that it? That is it. And of course it was mentioned, uh, and we'll come to this of course, by the Secretary of State, and I'll put that in its context, uh, in Parliament on two occasions. Um, well the other side said it was more than mentioned, it, it was mentioned. trumpeted. We'll come, come to that, put that in its context. But um, uh, the way we have put that to uh, the way the Secretary of State described it, really an alternative case. What he has described as being, as being that the main thing was the Airport Commission's recommendation was there good reason to depart from it, we could find no good reason. Gatwick did come up with new and old information which made it very close, made it very difficult for Gatwick, but in the case of ENR, there was nothing. Uh, and what is more, hypothetically, if there had been a case otherwise to uh, prefer ENR, there was the additional point that we had less certainty about it being delivered. But that is always in the context, in fact, on analysis, when it's being said, you know, if there had been good reason to depart from the airport's commission and to prefer the ENR on its objective merits. And that is a counterfactual thing. But that point was in separate state mind, again, as we've accepted throughout. But the court is entitled to, to look at the substance and the significance of the main reason, which are these objective merits, driven in particular by capacity. Well, you just so, use the word main. Yes, the main reason. Uh, what Mr. Kingston well, submits is, is that the, if there is an unlawful reason, then it doesn't have to be the only reason, or even the main reason, as long as it played a material part. Well, like the way I put it just now, the true reason, the effort, the real reason, is the, the assessment <laughs> of the greater benefits based on all the factors which yes. I've just been through. Well, the way I put it just now, what you accepted was that this was a factor noticed but extraneous to the real decision making. Is, yes. that, is that a fair formulation? That's a fair formulation. It was noticed and indeed put forward uh, as a potentially point that logically only arises if you consider that the ENR is the better scheme, or could be the better scheme, but for the lack of assurance. It was my Lord's point earlier as well that it was a sequential process of decision making. Yes. Stage A is, is there any reason to depart from the Airport Commission's analysis? Answer no, if, uh, resilience and so on. If the answer to that is no, then you, whatever else comes on is, um, in that hypothesis, irre not irrelevant, but not a, um, an ex it's an extraneous factor which does not matter, logically, is your point. That's my point.
But that judgment how then do you to be made. How then do you account for what uh, Mr. Kingston relied on, which is the Airport Commission um, uh, pre final report November 2014 in bundle, slim bundle 16A, paragraph 419, where there is at least one line in the in that preliminary document, which refers to the risk of delivery times because of the need for commercial negotiations. Well, that, that indeed is the very next point. This is the first of my, my headings, and I gave you those five headings, starting with the Airport Commission process, and that point arises directly in that context, so let me deal with it straight away. Um, can I deal with it, first of all, by reference to the judgment at um, paragraph 16 to 18? Remind ourselves of the categorization of the footage. My question actually is 16 to 18. I'm just distinguishing in the specific case of deliverability between um, scheme specific and manager <coughs> specific uh, factors. <coughs> Paragraph 17. So after explaining what deliverability is, uh, explain some of them are objective, in the sense that they have scheme specific or character development, it's unaffected by what the <coughs> might be. Others may arise at the death of the promoter. Uh, these categories are not hermetically sealed. Then they give one example of that. Financeability may depend upon the nature of development and or a promoter. However, in the context of this claim, distinction is of some use. Now what, to ask my Lord's question, um, <coughs> is the court was careful to establish those limits as not being hermetically sealed, but still of use. The one reference in the whole airport commission process to anything which could be between the two, the Virgin, the very specific, is the one that Mr. Kingston uh, showed you. Um, I, in my submission, if we, actually, if we take that and actually look at the way the AC put it, it was in supplementary bundle one, uh, tab 16A. Actually, you may have, I think you have tab 16A separately in, in your new bundles. I'm sorry. Have yes, it's in the slender bundle. Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's the one with the tab 16A. In that, we will take up to uh, paragraph 4.19. To, to, to remind us all, because there are those listening behind you and elsewhere, uh, Mr. Palmer, who don't have the documents in front of them. Um, this is the Airports Commission. Uh, delivery Risk Assessment document. Mitigation. Chapter, uh, chapter or section 16, Delivery Risk Assessment and Mitigation, November 2014. <laughs> Paragraph 419. 419. The transfer of scheme design may present risks. The scheme design has been devised by HUB, is not owned or endorsed by HUB. The transfer of any relevant intellectual property may require commercial negotiations which could present a risk to delivery timelines. The scheme design depends upon these aligned uh, runways. That's what's novel. Uh, and it's sub subject to the intellectual property rights about how you can make such a scheme work in, in real life. Even if Hull had been promoting that scheme, they would have had to purchase intellectual property rights for it from Hull. Now, of course, they might have decided to option it. They might have, rather than outright buy it first, they might have come into any kind of commercial negotiations. But that point would be true have to have at some point commercial negotiations over the purchase of those IP rights, regardless of who the actual promoter before the Air Force Commission was. But I can see that that point is borderline, <coughs> and, and may, may be a good, another good example of where the categories are not hermetically sealed. So you're right. making a distinction between buying the property rights and actually promoting it? Actually promoting it. And when we get to the SOPs, and with 
seeing this foreshadowed in the judgment. There's a whole series of other deliverability risks which arise, which are promoter specific, and arise in the context of uh, a scheme where the, the promoter of it is not the person who is proposing to deliver it, but is depending on how to deliver it if it is chosen. There's a whole series of points which arise. None of those points were considered by the AC at all. That was not within their scope, within their remit. They were simply looking at those objective, scheme-specific risks. And that paragraph, that single paragraph in the entire process is as close as it comes. So we say it's not right, uh, so it's not wrong for the uh, court, the divisional court, uh, to uh, treat uh, the AC's assessment of the merits as being uh, objective in nature, which is the relevant references in the judgment. It's judgment paragraphs 23 to 25 and 27, being the unchallenged conclusion on the objective merits of the MWR scheme. And there was no challenge. Uh, section 13 didn't bite. We weren't in an ANPS uh, process at this point. That came later. Uh, and so the point is made, paragraph 27, there's no challenge on, on, on that. And uh, <coughs> well, on that point, that there was a challenge back to the Air Force Commission, which failed, but the, um, not on this point, or anything to do with it. Uh, and then paragraph uh, uh, 127 of the judgment. There, the AC is concerned only with objective deliverability on the basis of the evidence before it and its own expert analysis of determined that looking only at matters relevant to objective deliverability and leaving out of account any additional risks arising out of considerations of objective deliverability, the MWR scheme was preferable, and that conclusion was never challenged by any parties before us. AC final report itself, I don't need to turn it up now, but the reference is in Supplementary Bundle 1, tab 22, uh, uh, from page 392. Specific references <coughs> are pages 448 to 9. Sorry, can you give us a reference? So it's uh, Supplementary Bundle 1, let's look at it now, uh, tab 22. chapter on operational viability assessment. Uh, this is uh, a chapter which considers, I think this chapter because it's the one in which the factors uh, relevant to respite, resilience and safety appear. So this chapter turned out to be the decisive points to their effect on capacity. Uh, and you get the conclusion of that chapter at 448. <coughs> See that at the bottom of the page heading conclusion. Uh, uh, final sentence there. Second highest capacity increase in flexible prefix. Uh, it seems to be very strongly on over the page. That's that conclusion. Uh, ending at 12.31, the final few lines, Northwest scheme clearly formed better than extended form of runway scheme due to larger capacity for less constrained airfield and greater certainty of respite. And then you get to chapter 13, which is the recommended option for expansion. And 13.3. Uh, you can see the headline conclusion commission has unanimously concluded the proposal for a new northwest runway. And 
explanation in this case should have been against the strongest case. There is more substantial economic and strategic benefits than any, any other shortlist option. Strengthening connectivity capacity and increasing productivity, striking a fair balance between national and local priorities. The required to make recommendations designed to maintain the UK's position as a global hub for aviation. These are the most likely route uh, of achieving that. And the rest of the chapter explaining that uh, preference uh, follows the whole of chapter 13. I won't take time over it, over it now, but the uh, short submission is a perusal of it would reassure the court. That we the court was absolutely right to describe that as preferring the North West, West runway scheme purely on its objective uh, merits. Specific factors. So that, that was the AC report, and that um, uh, led to it uh, being uh, considered and validated uh, by the uh, Secretary of shown uh, that document uh, earlier. Uh, it's in your little bundle at tab 22B. Uh, this is your second heading now. This is the second heading on the last right? The review of the Airport Commission final report. The reference again. Okay, this is your little bundle at 22B. Uh, summary of findings is on page uh, 479 12. sound and robust piece of evidence on which the government can base decisions as to whether further airport capacity is required and as to where that capacity would best be located. So no, no decision on either of those two points at this stage. It's just, uh, um, uh, as it's explained in the series of chapters, reviewing the evidence base, whether there are any substantial gaps, whether there's anything else they needed at that stage, uh, whether they could treat it as a sound and robust piece of evidence. The answer is yes. That formed the foundation of their subsequent conclusion, both that a new runway was needed at all, remember chapter two of the NPS, uh, and then where that capacity should be located, and chapter three of the NPS. That's where it <coughs> comes from. Um, the next stage was the uh, SOP uh, process. Want to introduce that by first going back to the judgment at paragraph 30. To the, introduce the areas of uncertainty that were left surrounding the ENR scheme at this point. Okay. 
cannot just take the cross from Hub, that the package of recommendations from the Airports Commission are all accepted, and assume without information from Hub that, that is what would be delivered. What I'm talking about is the mitigation, environmental protection measures which uh, the AC had identified. The question is, if the hub scheme delivered this, would you be able to get Hull to sign up to that and make it work? Um, then subsequent uh, uh, paragraph 32 and uh, 33, we've shown this before. Underlying many of the concerns which have been addressed, I'll show you 35 first, so that's the context. Uh, just, uh, how uh, concerns which have been made to the AC, as part of the AC's process, they have commented on the ENR scheme in terms of, first of all, runway capacity. <coughs> You'll recall that that was a point that was ultimately upheld by the AC. Respite. Ultimately upheld, uh, air noise effects, safety, point ultimately upheld, uh, deliverability, uh, uh, so the timing, they said it could agree it can be delivered by 2023, because it would be later than 2026. Ultimately, 2030 was the judge of the article. In substance, the point was accepted from a policy perspective, but 2030 is our, is our, is our ask. Uh, and then the point about costs, which I did not find this way. So these points were all filtered. What does commercial complexity consenting strategy mean in Little Roman 5? In um, different points, um, uh, the uh, commercial complexity results around the, the, the need to negotiate deals and to, um, to uh, have in place. Uh, uh, you have to go back to that section of that, of that section I showed you on commercial. Um, that, that's a nodding in the direction of promoter. Well, not, when you, not when you look at the substance of it. So the right bundle. There was that single paragraph which I addressed you on, which comes in under the topic, of the heading of commercial. The other. Factor which is set out there, if you'll notice paragraphs 4.17 to 4.18, and the commercial viability of this scheme has to be considered carefully. <coughs> Consenting strategy, as I understand it, goes towards the process of getting development consent a consent order. You don't know what, what Hull's concern was. This was a less consensible uh, proposal to put before, ultimately, for the decision maker in the context of a DCO application because its benefits were weaker, in essence, uh, because it had these disadvantages such as the lack of respite and so forth. Uh, construction schedule complexity. Uh, and underlying many, if not all, of these concerns was the fact that the ENR scheme was a novel proposal. So that's where the SOPs come in. If you go to 39, it introduces the engagement with each of the promoters in the SOP process. But six lines up from the bottom. about a suitable package of mitigations, future working relationships, and delivery plans. More generally, this engagement acted to inform the government's assessment of deliverability in the event a need for capacity was accepted, and their scheme became the government's preferred scheme. So that's the point of the process. And then at 40, the last few lines, because the claims would not be delivering the ENR scheme in any event, as the submission presaged, claims SOP contained less about and was less clear and certain about delivery than the uh, other uh, SOPs. And then at 47, uh, 
Roman and, and Bible. Attention to all of paragraph 47 is the distillation of the relevant passages of Hub SOP. But for this purpose, can I go straight to Roman 5, which is on page 1971? <laughs> Dealing with section 3, so the parallels are numbered in the identity text 3.1 onwards. 3.1 ending with three lines that was acknowledged by HUB as it would be for HUB to procure the development and implementation of its scheme in the manner outlined in this SOP. 3.2 is acknowledged um, that the scheme is conditional on HUB reaching agreement with HAL take forward such developments and implementation of the scheme in accordance with this SOP may include amongst other matters sale, license, otherwise transfer of intellectual property rights. 3.3 confirms that how and how have undertaken commercial discussions regarding a possible agreement. Um, then from about eight to ten lines down, however, should the government conclude that HUB's scheme is the preferred scheme, then HUB is confident commercial discussions regarding the agreement will be resumed and satisfactorily concluded with HAL in relation to the sale, license, or those transfer of appropriate rights and the development and implementation of the scheme to ensure a successful delivery. It is acknowledged that the development and implementation of the scheme would be conditional on HAL undertaking appropriate due diligence on the scheme, some of which HAL would wish to conclude or commence as part of reaching an agreement, which HAL has acknowledged may include, but not be limited to uh, the following a series of factors, including due diligence exercise, and the last point of assessment of the commercial merits of and capital cost for the scheme. Just pausing there. At various points in the submissions to the you refer to this whole provision as a competition. Competitors in any competitions are the winner gets all. This is an unusual competition because uh, I'd say it's not rightly described as a competition at all, so it's not in the sense of competition at all, but we'll get to that. Um, in the here, HAL is proposing something which it was dependent on HAL to do, and would at all times depend on HUB, on the base of HUB's own proposal, of HAL signing up to it and delivering it, and acknowledging here that that was conditional on due diligence, as you'd you expect, and on HAL's own assessment of the commercial merits and capital costs for the scheme, which we know from HAL's earlier submissions was a matter of dispute uh, between them. They thought HUB had underestimated the cost of the scheme. Accordingly, HUB would use 3.4 now, best endeavours to enter into the agreement with HAL within 30 days of, and in any event as soon as reasonably practical or after, receiving a notice from the Secretary of State, effectively that its scheme is a preferred scheme. So that 30 day period would be triggered by the preference decision being made in ENRC in favour. At that point, it was HUB's own proposal that they could do this, what was required within 30 days, to enter into that agreement, notwithstanding that they had acknowledged that some of the work which would be required to be done would need to be done in advance of reaching the agreement, as I've just shown you at the bottom of 3.3. Emphasize this is not a deadline imposed on HUB by the Secretary of State. This was HUB explaining how its proposal would work in the acknowledgement that it would be responsible for it to procure the scheme and make sure it happened within the timelines which would be required. So then you get to three point uh, uh, five and uh, three point seven in each case. HUB will be using best endeavours to procure such actions taken. 2.7 HUB will and will procure that HAL will develop a detailed and robust proposal for the entire funding of the scheme. 3.9, the government's role in relation to expanding out the capacity as that of an enabler through the exercise of its public functions and not in this context, procurer of works, services and of goods, whether from HUB, HAL, <coughs> The government also has a broader role which includes developing policy, promoting legislation, exercising public functions. HUB acknowledges and will procure such acknowledgement from HAL. These roles will actually be better used to the effective development and implementation of the scheme from time to time. Um, I'm going to take you next to something 
trying to keep on going. Three. <coughs> Tab 62. <coughs> the witness statement is low. What is Ms. Lowe really saying? It was clear from the outset that it was for Hull Hub to provide the department with comfort on this issue. Yes. When was it for Hub to provide comfort? Well, th throughout, in terms of 
um, in, in explaining how their scheme was going to be developed, if it was chosen, how would it be brought forward, on what time scale, how are you going to get from plan on the paper to space to the ground. Uh, and their plan was, within their suggestion, a tightly defined timetable to reach an agreement with HAL, but recognising that HAL would not in practice enter into such an agreement, not only whilst it was itself putting forward its own proposals, but, but in order to never sign such an agreement unless it was secure with the finances, secure with the merits, had done its due diligence. This was a project which would work for it, and for which it would be thereafter after buying the life the IP rights, commercially responsible for delivering and operating. All this being done, what confidence do you have that how we'll do this? We're confident. I think these are, would you accept, promoter specific considerations. Those, those are. Yeah. And, and the relevance of this paragraph will be I'm trying to show you all the evidence for everything at once that I can give shorter on a lot, but we get to the issue of expectation. Was there a legitimate expectation engendered through all these meetings as Mr. Kingston submitted that this would be put aside until after a preference decision? The answer was, was, was no, it was a concern that we had throughout. And indeed, the terms of the SOP itself uh, required uh, engagement with with, with HAL. Right. Thank you. Um, that is a good moment to uh, pause for the evening tomorrow on the basis of these questions of uncertainty uh, by the time that Mr. Grady took over the Secretary of State had not been resolved so we come to the relevance within that context of the commitment that we asked to come to In a sentence wet our appetite for tomorrow what's your answer to the other side's point Mr. Donoghue's point that Mr. Kingston's point that what Mr. Grayling said um, is somewhat at odds with the, the base plate, as you call it, of what the, the basis upon which the decision was actually being made. It's one thing for Mr. Grayling to have said the merits of the Northwest Runway are obviously, there's no reason for departing from the Airport Commission. And by the way, there's this, this other reason wasn't put in those yeah. terms at all. The, the answer is that he had in mind a counterfactual situation where even if we hadn't concluded that the merits were in favour of NWR, there still would have been an additional hurdle for uh, HUB to overcome. The trouble is he didn't actually say that. N not in th those terms. He, because in those he terms. was speaking in an extemporary context in the course of to and fro debate in the House of Commons the first time uh, giving evidence for the Transport Committee never said anything of the kind in any formal communication of the government's views and the state of reasons within the statutory regime which required the reasons to be given which was sufficient to justify the proposal being put forward. There was always that distinction made and there is in, in all frankness an inaccuracy in terminology used in the way it is presented when understandably it is presented in that way but are we inviting the court as the So, so court, he misspoke, to, did he? Essentially, well, but by, by looking under the bonnet Looking under the bonnet, what do you mean? Because when you say it's the biggest reason, uh, the Secretary of State uses that word biggest again in another context. I can give you the reference now uh, for overnight. Uh, the, um, it is of significance that when he uses that word, in the, um, he uses it again in the note of the meeting, which the court will find set out as paragraph 85 of the judgment. That, that sets out an account of his thinking, but it's still on analysis extraneous to the real driving uh, force of the decision, which is there's overwhelming evidence as to where the greatest net benefits are. Speaking for myself, Mr. Palmer, and this applies to everyone actually, uh, can I just sound a note of caution? insofar as any reference is going to be made to statements in Parliament, because there is a live issue about whether anything this court says, or indeed anyone else says outside Parliament, may infringe the Bill of Rights. Now, the Divisional Court reached the conclusion that it wasn't necessary to decide that point. 
And that may be right, that may be wrong, we'll have to think about that. But insofar as submissions are going to be made, for example, along the lines that somebody misspoke in Parliament, at least speaking for myself, that begins to ring alarm bells, because, because that does begin to suggest that some criticism is going to be made of statements made in Parliament. I'll address that directly to my Very well. Very well. And we're alive, of course, to the fact that the Speaker to the House of Commons has made written submissions before this court, although uh, it's not appearing to make all the submissions. Very well. Uh, that is a convenient moment, Mr. Palmer. Thank you. Uh, we shall sit again at 10 in the morning. I repeat what I've said earlier in the day, at least once. Our intention is to complete the hearing, uh, subject to that earlier start, within the normal sitting day. Thank you. Thank you.